Hey, thanks, Priyanka. I truly appreciate the privilege of being here. And uh, this is probably my whatever nth uh, Confluence uh, session. Uh, enjoy the session, enjoy the participation. It's been a great event. Congrats to Perry and the team. So, uh, so first of all, obviously, Vijay started off on a great topic about you know talent and how we can bring talent in. I think I'm, I'm going to follow up. You may, may we be able to hire the talent. The question is, how are we going to get them to pay attention? Right. So that's very important. You can bring the people in, but if they don't pay attention, you're not going to get the productivity. So, I guess this uh, this question about you know attention devices, uh, you know digital, uh, you know uh, you know uh, distractions has been going on for a long time, and I think a lot of us are aware of it. And there have been some steps that have been taken to uh, to, to kind of handle that. So I just want to take a slightly different and a provocative look at this. So so it kindly indulge me. Uh, some of what I might say may be politically incorrect, but these are some some thoughts. And I think this is time for us to really look at this very seriously and kind of look at this and and kind of come with some creative solutions for it. So, so a little bit of background. <clears throat> so um, my my eldest daughter is a big fan of Zen. Okay, and uh, we were talking the other day. And this kind of struck me, that is, you know, there was this uh, Zen student you know, who really wanted to go and learn something. And he said, you know, I want to learn. The master said 10 years. Then he said, I'll work harder. I'll work, you know, I'll do all kinds of sacrifices. And the master said, it's going to take you 70 years. So this is actually a very, you know, telling kind of a, a story from Zen, which means that sometimes um, the faster you go, the slower you get. Okay. So. And I thought this is an extremely pertinent uh, point uh, in our discussion today. And in many ways, that's the reason why I even suggested this topic. So it's all about trying to be deliberate. And, um, you know, and deliberate could be mindfulness, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I think this is a very important point that, you know, fast is not the answer. Slow is the answer. Okay. So the tortoise is probably going to win the race and not the hare okay, out here. So. So if really think of this, uh, you know, and look at what organizations are doing. I think all of us have done this. Okay, uh, you know, we say let's teach people mindfulness, let's teach people meditation. Okay, let's teach people, uh, you know, listening skills. So a lot of us go through these skill development kind of programs. So we're looking at this as a skill gap. Okay, and um, and that's something I think we need to reflect on. Is it a skill gap or is it something else? Okay. So what really happens is you go for this mindfulness session. And two weeks later, we are unmindful again. So, and and second thing, a lot of organizations also start to get very Orwellian in this, which means that uh, they don't trust people. They start to micromanage your time. You know, you have to be every moment in front of your computer. I'm going to capture your keystrokes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, for example, there is today technology that can be very, very intrusive. For example, today, let's say you're driving a car or a truck. Technology can kind of tell you whether you're paying attention and if you're going to fall asleep. And in case you're going to do that, it'll kind of wake you up. So imagine that being used in the workplace. You know, imagine that you know you're sitting there, you know, and in front of the the, the computer, the screen, and uh, and the computer is able to tell you, buddy, you're falling asleep. You're not paying attention. Pay attention. So I don't think any of us want to get to that or will you? I think, but there are organizations which can get to that extreme. So the way I kind of think about it is. These are, you know, skill gaps that we're looking at, but I don't think they're skill gaps. This is something more fundamental. While these are some solutions, but this is not the solution. And we really need to look at the, at the root problem, a root cause. Okay. Now, the question is, what's the root cause? Okay. And I think there is a, there is a, a, a clash between what the organizations want and what the individual wants. And I think that's something we need to really understand well in order to be able to solve for this particular problem. So what do you mean by that? Okay. Somebody said the more is a four letter word. Okay. And, um, and I tend to agree because today all of us want more, whether it's the organization or the individual. Okay. Now, what does the organization want? See, most of the organizations are still stuck in what I call the industrial mindset. Okay. What's the industrial mindset? Industrial mindset is about being able to produce things faster, better, and cheaper. Okay. And I call it a production kind of a mindset. Okay. And idea is, you know, you take something, you know, you keep polishing it, okay, until it gets better and better. And you make a systemic process out of it. And once you make a systemic process out of it, you can actually ship it to the lowest cost location that can execute on it. So that's by and large the industrial, uh, you know, mindset. 
And quite often that's also applied to software engineering. Okay. And at the same time, uh, so that's one, you know, uh, one part of the equation where the organizations want more, which is better, faster, cheaper, using an industrial mindset with a production kind of uh, outlook. At the same time, an individual has his own, you know, more. So the individual wants more distraction, more novelty, more experiences, and you know, but his his needs are a lot more emotional. So here we have an industrial equation trying to kind of meet up with an emotional kind of an equation, and I, I think that's where the the uh, the, the clash of the the uh, the civilization, so to speak, is. So unless we're able to bridge this gap, okay, I don't think we'll be able to solve the problem fundamentally. So which means that in order for us to look and, uh, at this problem and, and kind of come up with some creative solutions, we need to take a look at both the enterprise and the individual. I don't think solving it from the, uh, just training people on you know, mindfulness extra is going to work. Yeah. And secondly, I, really, I, I just want to kind of stress on this point. That is, <laughs> today we use the term agility. Okay? And I think it's one of the most you know, used, misused terms in the world okay, today. Everything is agile, everything is agility. And, I, I kind of think of, you know, agility is the new term for more. I want more, okay? So instead of saying more, we are just saying agile, okay? And I think we need to get out of that. I think we need to really find the, what agility means. And I'll kind of talk about what agility means uh, from my perspective uh, down, down, down the line. Uh, but I think that's something for us to reflect on. We should stop wanting more. We want, we want, we should slow down, okay? And do uh, more perfect work. That's the way I can think about it. <clears throat> so, I talked about the fact that both the individuals need to change and the organizations need to change. So, what do I mean by the organizations need to change? So, what does the industrial mindset bring to you? Okay. So, once you're an industrial mindset and a production mindset, you're essentially optimizing, okay, which means that you are actually doing incremental change. When you're doing incremental change, you start to get to the average over a period of time. Okay. And quality and excellence are at the edges, not at the average. Okay? So organizations need to move from the average to the edge. Organization needs to stop thinking about the fact that, you know, if they have to differentiate themselves in the marketplace, both from a product and services perspective and from a talent perspective, they need to move from the average to the edge. Okay? And similarly, I think individuals need to also start to move from the average to the edge. Okay? At the same time, what organizations need to do is they need to, I'm using the term enroll. I'm not saying employ. There's a huge difference between being enroll and employ. Enroll is you're telling somebody, you know, you come voluntarily, be part of my journey. Okay. I'm not going to employ you to do something. You are part of my journey. And I wanted to use the term artist because organization needs to start to think of people as artists, not as painters. There's a huge difference between artist and a painter. So what do I mean by that? An artist is somebody who's proud of what he, what he does, what he delivers, okay? A painter is somebody who copies, okay? Once you have a sense of being an artist, there's pride in the work, there is freedom, okay? There's a freedom of expression and you want to do more, okay? So I think the mindset change for organization is move from average to the edge, look at enrolling people as, as artists, okay? And from, from the other perspective, organizations also need to understand what are the other drivers, you know, for this attention deficit? <clears throat> is it just external triggers? You know, we say a mail coming every five minutes or, a, or you know, and WhatsApp message coming every two minutes or whatever, or are they internal triggers? Okay. In my belief, the internal triggers are a lot more powerful than the external triggers. Internal triggers include, you know, we are bored. Okay. We were, so how do you, how do you, you know, fix boredom? Okay. We are anxious. Okay. How do you fix that? There's always uncertainty, the fear of missing out. So how do you fix that? So, Organizations need to reinvent themselves on these axes in order to be able to win the talent war. This is probably a you know kind of a very politically incorrect statement. Okay, and uh, you know, and I said you know what is agile? Okay, today like I said, agile is two things. One is more, and it's also we use a term interchangeably for speed. We want something fast. Okay, and we say agile. Okay, and agile also we measure in software engineering in terms of velocity. Right. Again, it's in a way of speed in the right direction, so to speak. Also, we start to measure, you know, in terms of, you know, production units, that is how many story points, how many epics, et cetera, et cetera. So again, we have taken this concept of agile and put a production mindset to it. And I think we need to start to think of it very differently. 
I think agile is about adjustment. Okay, it's not about speed. So what do I mean by adjustment? So today, whenever we do anything, we are off course or right from the day one. Okay, agility is about being able to constantly correct course and bring yourself out, you know, to the final destination point in an optimal manner. It's about adjustment. So, you know, what do I mean by adjustment? Organizations need to be willing to say that I'm not putting a perfect product out. If you look at Agile today, agility, when you're about talking about speed, there's a chance of you crashing, okay? And we start to put a lot of, you know, devices and, you know, processes and methods, et cetera, in order not to crash, okay? But we know that we're not going to deliver a perfect product. Organizations need to accept that we will not be delivering a perfect product when we use this, you know, agility as a, as a lever. So organizations need to be able to tell customers, okay, that yes, you know, it's not a perfect product, but I'm going to get there. So that's why to me, agility is about adjustment. And the measurement should move from speed to adjustment. How far are you, of course, and how are you going to correct it? I mean, this is a, probably a bad example. Uh, for example, we all know, you know, uh, there was a company which invented the glue that did not stick. Okay. And what did it do? It made a post-it note out of it, right? So it's, it's a, I mean, it's, we call it innovation. I would call it adjustment. Okay, we adjust it. Okay, so I think organizations need to be willing to put products out which are not finished. And when I say not finished, not I'm not saying that it doesn't work, but it kind of works. But tell the customers, tell the employees, tell everybody this is what we're looking for, because agility and speed and perfection don't go together. Okay, and I think organizations need to accept that. And, you know, change the way we measure ag agility. It's a very important uh, part of the whole, you know, equation for, for both the organization and the individual. The second thing is in order to be at the edge, I talked of the term craftsman, right? I talked of the term artist and I'm calling it craftsman, okay? Craftsmanship is very different from a worker, okay? Today, we are trying to break down, you know, software engineering into kind of smaller chunks, which we can do repeatable, et cetera, et cetera. I think we need to start to treat it as a craft. Okay, once you start to treat it, treat it as a craft, people look at it very differently. Craftsmen get involved in their work. Once they get involved in their work, there's a lack of boredom, there's lack of, you know, there's expression of freedom, and then work it starts to get much, much, much better. Okay. Second thing is, I think organizations need to look at it as doing it interesting versus doing it right. Okay. I'm saying obviously doing interesting and right. Let me give an example of this. So for example, you're driving down the road along, you know, whatever 200 mile or 200 kilometer stretch and you know, it's boring, right? One way you make it interesting is you can say, okay, uh, how many cars with, you know, the number plate, you know, starting with two are coming in this direction. So you start to make your journey interesting. Okay? Similarly, today there is technology that allows you to do it. Okay, for example, let's say a similar analogy is Let's say you're doing a repetitive, boring data processing work. So one of the challenges that the system could throw is how many transactions today that you're processing with this client ID, okay? I mean, you start to engage the mind, you know, and start to make it interesting, okay? This is probably a very trivial example of how to do it. But today, I think there is technology which allows you to integrate yourself in, it, itself into the workflow and make these kind of in, interesting kind of moves that makes your work interesting. So I think organizations need to shift from measuring only right. <clears throat> is it 100% accurate? Is it 100% FTR right? Is the quality 100% to how interesting that we have made it? We all have talked about this, flatten the hierarchy. And I think flatten the hierarchy is, is probably one of the most needed uh, you know, things in this, uh, this time because of the fact that today we can do it in a networked kind of an economy, in a networked kind of an organization structure. I don't see a need for having more than two, three layers from the top. Okay. So what does it do? It allows people to be in the spotlight much easier than when you're 10 layers down. Okay. And when people are in the spotlight, they tend to perform much better. So, so it's very important to flatten the hierarchy, not just from a span of control perspective, but we should look at it as the ability to give people the opportunity to be in the, in the spotlight. <laughs> Finally, <clears throat> today at scale, there's an ability for us to treat people differently. See, today, let's say you're shopping at, you know, whatever, Amazon or whatever, you get, you know, uh, targeted you know, advertisements, et cetera, for you, okay? Why can't the same thing be done from an employee experience perspective? Why can't I define my own leave policy? Why can't I define my own work hours? Why can't I have my own, you know, 
you know, pay whatever pay breakdown or whatever. So I think today at scale, you are able to actually treat people differently. And that's another unique proposition which organizations can look at. I have essentially two more things, okay? I think this is going to be key. Uh, we, are, we are all moving to what I call as the, the connection economy. Okay, the connection economy is about, you know, how well you're connected uh, to other people and how well you contribute. In order to connect, generosity needs to be one of the core values of an organization, okay? See, so only when you're generous, you're willing to give. And only when you give, you can get. Okay, it's very important for us to understand. And I think generosity will be one of the core values that organizations need to build there. You know, today, we have value statements which talk of many things, right? You know, accountability, crime-centric, et cetera. I think going forward, generosity needs to be one of the key things and not protection. Today, we're all measured on individual successes. I think organization needs to move from being, you know, uh, individual to a generosity mindset. I think so the HR systems, the rewards, the recognitions need to move to that. And finally, time. Okay. I think time is, uh, is, is probably is the single biggest differentiator in my opinion. I think um, flexibility in time is going to be one of the key things. All of us have the same 24 hours. So what do we do is going to be very important. Okay. So I think people should look at time as something which they can actually as a competitive advantage, which means that if others are not being mindful or in a concentrating and I can do 30 minutes of concentration, okay, it's a competitive advantage. So from an individual perspective, uh, we should look at it as a competitive advantage to be mindful and in actually uh, use time very creatively. From an organization perspective, I think organization needs to actually plan for time for people to to recover, to think, energize. Okay. For example, I'm saying, you know, you could say, see, I think we all know that some uh, companies like Google give like 20% of their time for innovation. I'm saying it needs to be built in everything we do. Let's say you have a one hour meeting, you probably are uh, given a 15 minutes time to re-energize. Okay. So this should be built in as part of the workflow uh, system of the organization. We should have, they should be built in time for you to think. So that's when there's an accountability for you to think. So organizers need to actually treat time very, very differently and not ask you to book the entire, you know, eight hours and, you know, talk, and, you know kind of figure out what you're doing every minute of those eight hours. So I think uh, this is going to be a fundamental uh, differentiator for everybody. And finally, I have uh, only one thing to say, you know, all of this is, you know, um, I think everybody knows, right? So there's nothing really kind of new. So I want to end it on the Zen uh, so it kind of says, right, you know, how do I live a perfect life? It's a very simple thing, right? It says, you know, avoid all evil and perform all good. And the master says, you know, and the student says, even a three-year-old knows it. Yes, even a three-year-old knows this, but, but even a hundred-year-old, you know, can do it. So, so these are things we know, uh, and these are things that we can do, okay? But this is going to take both the organization to change, some of the fundamental tenets and premises and the individual to also look at it very differently. But I think the change has to be a lot more systemic from the organization perspective, okay? While the individual can then be made to, to excel, okay? To have freedom, to be an artist. Okay? So I think going forward, uh, the industry is going to be different. I think uh, with, with the talent shortage and the, the need for us to re attract and retain talent, talent needs to be treated as artists. And that I think is going to be the biggest differentiator for, for all of us going forward. So uh, that's all I had. I'm open to any questions in case we have time or in case we don't have time, happy to take it uh, offline. Uh, so as I said, uh, some of this is politically incorrect, but uh, you know, it's okay. So, so thank, thank you. you so much, VRK. Um, I think you mentioned you know, the faster you go, the slower you get. Super powerful thought for all of us to take away. Uh, one quick audience question before we let you. You definitely very aptly spoke about agility being misused or misrepresented nowadays. Uh, so, so are there any other buzzwords similar to agility that you think are misused currently within organizations? Honestly, I mean, I think uh, you, you can have a dictionary of it. You, it can start with reimagine and reboot. By the way. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think, see, the, the, I think there's always good intention with starting with some word. At some point in time, it gets more. And, you know, it, it starts to become a lowest common denominator. And people tend to use it uh, very, very differently. So 
so i think i spent time on agility because i think it's it, it means something else okay and you know, uh, the point i want to make is when uh, the agile manifesto which is probably the early 2000s came it had a different kind of an organization see you needed everybody almost to be at the same skill level in order to be agile so you can't have you know a phd and a ukg student in one team and you know make it agile it really doesn't work okay so i think we have lost the the intention of what is agility or what is being agile and kind of morphed it okay and agile is about you know it's constantly working and tinkering so to speak and getting it right okay so i call it adjustment absolutely absolutely thank you so much for that and for sharing your expertise with us prk thank you appreciate it and have a great day you too